It's okay. But many, that's okay. So we can uh, can now start. So Jurosh from UC Berkeley and LBLN and L will tell us about deterministic Langevin and Hamilton Monte Carlo. So yeah, so thank you. Um, so this is a, a workshop on uh, physics and machine learning. Uh, and by machine and you know machine learning also in, in a broader sense encompasses statistical analysis and stuff like that. And one of the places where these two meet are the sampling methods. Uh, and the reason for this uh, are several folds. First of all, the sampling methods are something that, that we physicists are really interested in. Uh, but second, um, the you know machine learners and statisticians also interested in it. And so this is why uh, you know I thought this would. To discuss uh, here at this uh, workshop. So um, here's my outline. Uh, I'll talk about two different uh, algorithms, methods that we have developed and they're both and um, yet can be used for sampling. Uh, this may sound like an oxymoron, but I'll try to explain why it's not and why the Tunisian methods actually can be uh, useful for sampling. So um, first of all, what do I mean by sampling? The goal of sampling is get uh, particles uh, or samples which follow um, a target probability distribution. Uh, usually this is uh, a hard problem because it's high dimensional, uh, but it's also a hard problem because we don't know where the target probability distribution peaks. We also don't know what its uh, volume is. So in other words, even if it peaks somewhere, it doesn't mean that most of the posterior mass is at the peak. It might be actually uh, somewhere in a broader sense. Um, so the typical set might not be where the peak is. So there are these issues that uh, enter into sampling, which are different from, for example, optimization. You know, when we do optimization, we try to find a peak of a function of a target. Uh, but sampling is not the goal of sampling is not that. The goal of sampling is really to have a density, uh, you know, distribution of samples which follows the target density. And this, in general, is a very hard problem. It becomes even harder if you have multimodal uh, posteriors or peaks, uh, and we'll talk about that. Uh, two uh, most important examples, which connect back to what I said uh, earlier, are one is from statistics. Um, for example, Bayesian posterior uh, distributions are a typical example where we need samples, uh, sampling methods like Monte Carlo Marco chains. Um, but another one is in statistical physics, where um, we, for example, use these methods uh, to get uh, free energy, to get uh, all of the thermodynamic uh, quantities, such as the you know, energy, specific heat, susceptibility, and stuff like that. Okay? Uh, there, we also use MC Monte Carlo uh, methods to sample, and then we draw thermodynamic. Uh, we evaluate the thermodynamic properties from those. Now, all of the current state-of-the-art methods are stochastic. And so let me explain what I mean by that. And uh, okay, but before I do that, let me uh, say just a little uh, more about the typical target in statistics, which is uh, sampling for Bayesian posteriors. So in, um, in the Bayesian methodology, you have a likelihood, um, which is the probability of the data given the parameters. Let's call, let's call X. Uh, so this is the likelihood. This is the prior on the parameters. It could be a flat prior, uh, or it could be something informative. Um, and we want to get the posterior, which is uh, posterior, which is probability of the parameters given uh, the data. And you know, via the Bayes theorem, um, uh, we can uh, relate this to this. Uh, but there is an you know an unknown normalization constant uh, that we don't know. So. The issue here, the issue is that we don't know where the parameters, uh, where the likelihood peaks. Right? We don't know. It could be, you know, if, if the prior is much broader than the posterior, it could be, you know, the posterior to prior volume, uh, sorry, the prior, the prior to volume ratio could be enormous, you know, uh, 10 to 100 uh, sometimes. And um, and we can't cannot just do, I don't know, a grid search or something very naive, right? especially in high dimension. So we have to do something smarter. All right, so Monte Carlo chain methods are methods of choice. There are many different flavors, and I'll uh, show a few examples. Um, many issues of these methods. Um, for example, the samples are correlated. The chains may converged, which means that there's a burn in. In other words, you, you're still feeling the, the effects of the initialization of the chains. Uh, maybe they are not ergodic in the sense they haven't explored the full uh, phase, phase space. Um, 
some methods, most methods actually do not mix uh, well between uh, independent peaks. So this is the problem is multimodal, multimodality. So there's a lot of issues here. Um, one issue that is specific to our scientific applications is that our likelihoods can be very expensive. Sometimes to evaluate the likelihood, you have to run a, a, a simulation, for example, you know, an OD or a PD or something like that, you know, and that can be anything in terms of CPU time, you know, sometimes it's weeks. All right, so these are the, the issues that we face, and specifically in science, we face this one that we have um, very expensive um, likelihood. All right, uh, the, the, the core algorithm um, that is at the core of all of the methods is uh, sampling. Uh, but here, the idea is you, you, you draw a new sample around the previous sample. And this is why this is called the Markov chain. It only depends on the position of the previous sample. Um, with you, you, use, you have some probability uh, distribution to draw the new sample. And then you ask, uh, is the new sample in some sense better than the old sample? In what sense is it better? If this R here is larger than one, then we always accept the new sample. And if it's less than one, then we accept it with probability by R. And what is this thing here? This thing is basically telling you, first of all, what the target density here the, uh, is uh, of the new sample relative to the previous sample, but also you need to take into account these transition uh, probabilities in both directions, okay? So uh, typically in a, in a probabilities hasting sense, uh, this transition probability would be just a Gaussian sphere around the current sample, okay? So uh, that leads to metropolis hasting algorithm, which does not use the gradient and it's very slow in high dimension. So uh, better uh, samplers are uh, samplers which um, are gradient based. And the prototypical uh, example of Langevin and Monte Carlo, where uh, you Langevin dynamics, this is an overdamped Langevin dynamics. Um, so it's first order equation, velocity, x dot x to the velocity, by the gradient target, let's call it u um and uh, plus some noise okay so it's a classic stochastic differential equation the first one that was ever written you know and it describes things like random walk um and um one thing uh one can find if you discretize this try to solve this equation on a finite time step is that it leads to a biased distribution it doesn't actually lead to the correct distributions it's biased for any for finite uh, time steps and that's why statisticians like to correct for, uh, this one using metropolis adjustment, right? So the, 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 what I was describing on the previous slide, you know, they use this to correct uh, any bias that might be there in, in this method. Okay, uh, second method um, that is also gradient based is uh, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. And this one is very similar uh, in the following sense that a single step Hamiltonian Monte Carlo can be taught as Langevin. It, uh, but here in Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, you really try to solve uh, Hamiltonian dynamics. So in other words, you use momentum as well. And you have these leapfrog equations. Um, if you did, um, and basically you first update the momentum uh, based on the gradient of the, of the target potential. Then you update the position based on the velocity, right? And then you update momentum again. All right, so this is a leapfrog. And what is nice about leapfrog scheme is it's symplectic. And so while it doesn't, quite conserve energy, it all, you know, always stays, energy is roughly conserved. But it's, so in other words, you can do a long-term integration and still um, do a good job. And I wanna show you now a movie because nothing is better than showing you how these things work. Um, and let's see, this is a great website um, that has, uh, so here I'm running um, uh, Mala. So this is Metropolis Adjusted Langevin. Uh, and um, what it's doing is the following, right? So it's taking gradient steps. So you see it's moving, the circles are moving. The circles are the, the uh, one is drawing a, a Gaussian from a Gaussian distribution, which is this circle. But the circle is moving, the position of the center, it's not just the previous position of the sample, but also this some gradient uh, information of the target. Gradient would be, you know, for example, here, the gradient direction would be this. All right, so this, this thing is moving around both due, due to the gradient and uh, then it's drawing a sample, ask whether this sample should be accepted or rejected based on this metropolis um, thing. And when it's accepted, you, you record this sample and then you do it again. So it's in some sense, you can see, right? It's kind of slowly moving around, uh, not terribly efficient, but it's collecting these samples and these samples are uh, slowly getting to the target. This is a target, right? And if we wait long enough, right, we will get 
to this target distribution. You can see already, you know, after uh, samples, this is getting there. Okay, so this is Langevin, um, which is basically um, Brownian motion, right, uh, in an external potential. Okay, let me show you now Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. Uh, all right, now this one is doing these trajectories, Hamiltonian trajectories. Um, and uh, it records the sample only after some fixed number of steps. Uh, I don't know, let's say 30. I forget what, what the number is. So it's somewhere here. Uh, you see, it, it's doing a, a deterministic uh, trajectory. But then, the end, it still needs to first accept or reject this that based on this metropolis things, uh, uh, acceptance rate. And then it then needs to change the direction of the momentum. It needs to draw another momentum from, uh, from a random direction. And so it's still stochastic, but it's less stochastic than the previous one. And in terms of convergence rates, um, basically, this one is converging a lot faster than the other one. Right? So Hamiltonian Monte Carlo is converging a lot faster than uh, Langevin Monte Carlo. The general message here is the less stochastic your sampler is, the faster it's converging. Okay. Uh, so, um, and that's basically simply a statement that random walk, you know, brown emotion is extremely inefficient, right? The more dynamics you can put in, the better. So that's the motivation, therefore, for us to investigate purely deterministic methods, which have no stochastic component at all. All right, are there any questions about this? Let me get back to my... All right, so now um, let's look at the first um, deterministic uh, equation. Uh, first deterministic method. Um, let's look at the Fokker Planck equation. Um, so, Fokker Planck equation is an equation for the density distribution. It describes how the density distribution is evolving uh, under external potential. And it's really a density description of the Langevin equation, right? So, Langevin equation. Uh, if you follow the particle and you solve the Langevin equation, it will give you a particle implementation of this density, but you can also look at the equation in a, in a sense of the density itself. All right, so Fokker Planck equation is nothing else but conservation equation, which is saying that the you know, change of the density equals to the flux. The flux uh, this, you know, is given by the current density, uh, Q, times the gradient of the target density minus the gradient of the current density. Okay, so it's a continuity equation for density particles, and it's it's time dependent, right? So, um, in fact, let's rewrite like this. Let's introduce another potential here, which is the, uh, which is the log of the current density Q. Let's call it let's call it the current density Q. And we can rewrite the current uh, the current um, uh, as density times. And now, what is this? Uh, Velocity term, it's the gradient of the target density minus the gradient of the current density. All right, so what this equation is saying is if the current density does not equal, if the gradient of the current density does not equal the gradient of the target density, then the, the, there's going to be a flow, uh, the, there will be a flux, and there will be uh, the density will be changing. On the other hand, once we have reached equilibrium, uh, these two gradients are equal and uh, things will stop moving. All right, so what's nice about these uh, equations is that uh, the, any normalization that there might be, so this, this, this one is usually unnormalized, this u of x, this target. Uh, we don't know the partition function, but it does because it's greater than zero, so um, it drops out. Okay, so the deterministic version, therefore, of the lunge of an equation is uh, x dot equal to v, but now v is going to be still the, the gradient of the current uh, of the target density minus the gradient of the current density. So, um, and again, moving around x dot equals to zero when the two gradients are equal. All right, so uh, our proposal, therefore, is, uh, well, let's try and do this as a particle density method. And let's try to take the particles to estimate the density, to estimate Q, estimate its gradient, V, and then plug this into this equation to update the particle positions. And let's keep doing this um, until until we get that these two terms are exactly equal to each other and things stop moving. 
So this is our deterministic Langevin algorithm. Uh, this is in a paper that was submitted and was accepted today in Europe. So um, I was ha very happy to get this email today. Um, and uh, uh, the idea is we start from the prior. So we draw samples from the prior. Um, and so that's the input. Uh, yep. um, We first run a normalizing flow to in the current density. We get gradient times delta. Okay, so it's a very simple uh, first order uh, dynamics. This is nothing else but st standard gradient descent method, right? And so you, you can actually use any gradient descent methods. It uh, doesn't have to be simple gradient descent, can be stochastic, can be Adam, can be anything you want. It can be high or even BFGS or something. Okay, so what we need therefore is uh, normalizing flows to get this density, right? And um, well, there've been a lot of talks about normalizing flows already um, here. The idea of normalizing flows is to map um, from a density distribution to a target density, which is usually a Gaussian or vice versa. So for example, if we do it from a Gaussian to a complicated uh, density, um, there's usually a flow. In other words, uh, you know, it's a deep, uh, deep network so you have with many layers. Each one ha does something simple. Why simple? That's because we want this normalizing flow to be invertible. So each operation here, each F here has to be invertible. Uh, and simply invertible, so it has to be something simple. And uh, moreover, it, it, it has to be able to evaluate the Jacobian uh, very easily, right? This determinant of df over dx. And there are many different normalizing flows in the literature how to do this. Now, if you do it in this direction, then this is used for sampling, right? But um, you can also evaluate the density. And this is the application we're gonna be using here because our, our goal is to have samples and evaluate their density. You know, we don't really want to generate new samples or something like that. We don't care about that. What we really care about is the density estimation. So um, how is this usually done? It's done by training some network. Um, for example, if you do this along one direction, uh, you don't actually even need to train the network. You can this by matching the cumulative distribution function. So in 1D, this is uh, very easy to do. Uh, suppose this is the data. Suppose you want to uh, map this density to a Gaussian. You need to learn this function, and you can just literally just just map the the CDF cumulative distribution functions. Uh, this one to the Gaussian, and for example, in this case, you know the function that solves for this is this one here, and this maps this distribution to this distribution, right? And since this is a one-dimensional distribution, this is very easy to invert and very easy to get a Jacobian. Yes. Um, sorry, uh, just to check to see if getting it right. Like you are, um, uh, your your sampling evolves according to a Fokker Planck distribution. Am I right? Uh, uh, my, my distribution evolves according to Fokker Planck. So, okay, sorry, your your distribution, which is the okay. Your your goal is to approximate the uh, real distribution of uh, the target distribution. Am I getting it right? Yeah, okay. yeah. And the way you are, you are doing this is assuming that. Uh, there is a basically a, a drift in the Fokker Planck distribution, which is due to the real distribution minus the one the something you regress with the normalizing flow. Am I getting it right? Well, okay, Fokker Planck distribution is uh, a density description of the Langevin equation okay. the and, and vice versa. Is, I mean, right? Okay. So as time evolves, you know, the diffusion leads to particles settle down. Uh, according to the target distribution. Okay, so the the, um, the noise in the Langevin equation is uh, uh, an expansion like that. The, yeah, it's, on, it's on the brown in motion. Yes, yeah, yeah random walk. Yeah. But what, what about the flow? Because the, the flow is the one you induce in theory according to the u function, which yeah. is the ideal one, right? The yeah. one you want to. Yeah, 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 right. And if I if I understand correctly, you are introducing something which is the current estimate of this of the density yeah. of the density, which is the ln uh, of q. So this is a, a fake uh, like a, a fake potential you are adding to your process 
Uh, yeah, exactly. The, there. Yeah, the V function yeah. here is like a, a fake potential. It's not fake. Function. No, I mean, it really is. I mean, in this, this is still exact equation. This is still just, just this one is here is just uh, uh, okay, uh, Fokker okay, Planck. Okay, so th this is like. And this okay. equation is also exact, by the way. You know, uh -huh. if you know the density of the current density, then you can certainly write this down. This is an exact equation. But okay, so, but, but V is your estimate of right, U. Right, the approximation comes in when you start estimating V from the particle itself. Yeah. So you. Uh, okay, okay, okay. So your your estimate is v. So when v and u are equal, your your, your Fokker Planck equation tells you that to to change the distribution. When grad v equals to grad u, then stop. Yeah. Okay, then it stop. Okay, so it means that you have found the potential. Okay, okay. Yeah. So just to follow up on his question. <laughs> So just give me an idea of how you initialize it. That yeah. would that might help. Yeah, initialize from the prior. On the prior. Prior is usually, you know, a simple uh, simple distribution that you can sample from. You know, typically what well, typically people either use uniform prior between uh, you know between two to you know lower and upper bound, right? So that's very easy to draw from. Or maybe there's a prior that's also very easy to draw from. And that's, usually that's priors different. are very easy, right? To mm -hmm. draw from. Usually, yes, um, but that's the same if you were, you have two ways you could use this, like you were saying, right? You could do density estimation in one direction and then you could run it in the generative sampling. Yeah, yeah, and sure. You would pick the same, that initialization would be- Well, no, I mean, when we, base and posterior, we don't really care about the samples. No, we don't draw samples. So. We would not know what so to you're do with them. Okay, so we're only talking about density. Yeah. But actually, no, 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 and uh, no, I take that back. I'll, I'll describe. I'll describe how we can use the samples. I'll, okay. I'll describe. All right, here. There's someone else has. Yeah. Um, no, no, we do use the samples as well. Yeah. I hear it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I hear it. Quit. Yeah. You said it's easy to invert, but one D in one D only. In one. Yeah, D. yeah, but uh, even in one D only, like uh, here, uh, the derivative looks kind of flat. So when inverting. I could yeah, have yeah, a yeah, yeah. problem, yeah. right? Uh, if uh, it learns a parabola, for yeah, instance. Yeah, no, no, no. Okay, right. This is a technical. These are wheels, the rational splines, which are monotonic. So there are splines which are monotonic. So in other words, they are always invertible. They never go to zero, right? So there are specific uh, form of splines, for example, which which prevent you from having here because otherwise here, yeah. I mean that's because the density is almost zero here, right? And so here it, it goes almost flat, but not not exactly flat. You said that you initialize after your prior, and the prior is usually simple to sample, uh, but that's not completely true because uh, your prior might be encoded the, the invariance under some, such some symmetries and so on. Uh, so you can have an informative prior that is not uh, just a Gaussian. Uh. Yeah, fine. What? How do you do in that case? Well, usually priors are analytic. No, they, they, you know, you can write it down, right? So therefore, yeah, you, can, but you, you can also sample. I don't know. I mean, even your posterior is analytic. No. Yeah, it is. It's uh, just a multiplication of two likelihood times prior. So it's analytic. Uh, completely yeah, analytic. okay, fine. Uh, but the product is not analytic. It's not analytic to draw. It's not, you know, you can't sam draw samples anymore. No, no product, I'm not saying right? that uh, you can draw. You can draw samples from one analytic function. You cannot draw samples from a product of, of two analytic functions. No, wait. The uh, point is that even if you know the analytic function exactly, it might still be complicated to draw from it. Well, I don't know. Maybe I don't know what uh, what field you are in and what examples you're thinking in cosmology, for example, or in any any things I've worked on. This is never an issue, right? We always know how to draw from the prior. But if you have some specific examples, I'll I'll be happy yeah, to talk you know, about. But for example, just a stupid example is if you have invariance under scale transformation, your prior is usually one over x. It's not a Gaussian. It's not a uniform prior. Yeah, but usually we remap those, right? We just yeah, you use, can we use a, you know, we use a uh, parameter transformation. Usually right? depends on the transformation group that you are invariant under. So this is just a uh, Jeffrey's prior post. Yeah, no, uh, as I said, um, in all examples we have ever used, this particular concern was never an issue. If you think there is, we can talk and you can tell me exactly what you have in mind, Ryan. But Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, uh, let me describe this uh, slice iterative normalizing flow. I think it's, it's, an, it's an interesting flow. Um, um, this was published uh, in ICML last year. Um, I think it has some interesting properties um, that we were going to take advantage of. And you can think of it, if, if you know what um, independent component analysis is, um, th this one is a generalization of that. Um, and the idea is the following. 
uh, I just said it's actually very easy to do um, to map to a Gaussian in one dimension. And so the idea of, of this thing is build a flow, a general flow, high dimensional flow from a sequence of one dimensional transformations. Um, uh, and one, one way to do this is to, to have these uh, transformations to be along orthogonal axis. Okay, so we're looking for some rotation um, a matrix, which is orthogonal, and um, that matrix, in some sense, uh, we want to maximize the non Gaussianity uh, along the slice directions. What do I mean by that? So, for example, uh, this doesn't have to be against the Gaussian. Initial PDF is blue, the target is Okay, we're going to look for a uh, direction which is non Gaussian. Uh, well, sorry, not, not most non Gaussian, but direction which where the two distributions differ most. Uh, to define what differ, we use uh, um, uh, Wasserstein distance. In fact, we use uh, slice Wasserstein distance in the sense that we're using just 1D. Uh, and then we just look for the maximum um, uh, direction. So we call this max sliced uh, Wasserstein distance, and we can look at several directions at once. All right, so um, in this case, so what are we doing? We're looking for directions. For example, uh, right, if you look at the, this direction here, the projections are going to, well, sorry. If you look at this direction here, the projection, uh, uh, no. If you look at this direction, the projections here will be very similar, right, between blue and orange. On the other hand, if you look at this direction here, if you project this, one is not, and the Wasserstein distance is very, very large between these two. Okay, so then what do we do? We match the PDFs here, you know, using this spline, this, this monotonic spline that I had before. So now we have the two distributions equal along this direction only, right, along this slice. And what happens to the overall distribution? Well, we haven't solved the problem fully yet, but the two distributions are now closer to each other. In this particular case, for example, now the blue becomes this rather than this. Uh, it's still not quite the same as orange, but it's much closer to it. Right? And you can actually show that this process converges because you can do this again. Right? Now we're going to look for some other direction uh, in some other direction where we still have a, a vast uh, distance between the two slices and we do it again. Okay, so um, this method is simple because, um, because it can be done iteratively. It's not a standard machine learning training where you, you, know, you throw in, I don't know, zillions of parameters and you know, it could be as a black box. This really is an iterative procedure that is guaranteed to converge and that uh, at every step, you know what you do, okay? So how do you represent your actual, like initial, like the, the thing which you're varying? Is it like a product of uh, things or with samples that you kind of multiply or, or I mean, how, Sorry, do you, how do you get a distribution and then modify it in ju just some direction? Oh, the distribution are the samples themselves, right? You need to have samples. Yeah, okay. So, so you're representing like weighted samples or something like that? Well, you don't weight. They're just, you know, each sample has equal weight. Okay, okay. Yeah. And, and, and then how do you modify them when you kind of do this procedure? Oh, then you move the samples, right? And All right. The, you move them just like here, right? For example, here we have moved from blue to orange along this slice. You can okay. just move them along one direction. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, I mean, just to go back to this question, yes, you can draw samples from it. Uh, and that's actually, um, here is fashion MNIST. And you can see this as a function of uh, number of slices, um, number of iterations, how this works, right? You start, you start from white noise, and then, you know, you see, you get an, an uh, you know, a rough idea what is this already up to a few slices, but then if you want to get, have it perfect, then you need uh, hundreds. Uh, similar here for, for celebrity faces. Uh, and here are some um, samples um, from the trained uh, network, you know, and they look reasonably realistic, but basically comparable to the state of the art. But I don't really, really care about the application. What I care more is the density. So now, as I said, uh, this training also density. And um, how do we compare different uh, flows? How do we compare different density estimators? We, you know, taking the validation data uh, and we evaluate their density. In fact, we evaluate their log um, and um, we average the, or the, the, the validation data, right? And which, whichever is higher is, is better. Higher is always better, right? So, um, and the answer to how well you do obviously depends on how many um, training data you had. If you have very few training data, then 
learn the density very well. If you have lots of training data, then you do better. So here is basically. Um, one method that in high dimensions really doesn't do that well is kernel density estimation, um, underperforming against the state of the art normalizing flows. Um, there are several methods here that are state of the art, like MAF and Fjord and uh, uh, Flow, uh, and they do generally better um, with lots of data. They're very powerful. But one thing um, that we found is that for small data, our method, uh, which are these two methods, these two these two points here, they uh, it always outperforms uh, these methods for small training data. And the reason for this is again that a lot of uh, regularization because we're doing this iteratively and we're doing this along the slides. Uh, I'm showing two two versions here. One is with heavy regularization and one alpha is regularization parameter and one is with uh, without regularization. You know they're kind of comparable. Um, but uh, well, anyway, this is the performance. The one um, without regularization is also extremely fast. We're talking about seconds here uh, in order to train. All right, so that's uh, that's the enormous flow that we uh, for this um, deterministic Langevin. But now let's look at how this deterministic Langevin works uh, in practice. Um, here's the prior. This is just two dimensional uh, example. Uh, and uh, its posterior volume is much, much smaller than the prior volume, okay? So um, initial density, uh, because this is a prior, initial density is actually uh, uniform. The gradient of uniform is actually zero. So at the first step, these are these um, DLA updates. These are these uh, green updates. Um, Uh, uh, sorry, the, the blue uh, the blue updates. They are just following prediction. Now we know if you have high condition for a number, then gradient is not a, it's not a very good way to to converge, right? You have this ravine problem. I'll talk about that uh, later. Nevertheless, you see they're moving roughly in the direction of the turn. Right, um, but what's happening is close and close to the target. The second term, this grad V kicks in um, and starts now to move particles, not just uh, towards the target. So this is not just a great descent anymore because the gradient descent will just take you down to the center, right? Down to the, to, the, to the middle of this. Instead, this gradient V is pushing out, right? So we have a competition between gradient descent of the target trying to take us towards the center and this gradient V it's, it's kind of a, like a repulsive force uh, that is pushing outwards, all right? And and, um, and what happens as a result is that you see these blue blue uh, blue steps are getting smaller and smaller because the two terms are almost cancel. All right, so that's the idea behind this deterministic uh, Langevin. And now I'm gonna show you what these other steps are, uh, the green ones, which uh, um, can be can be used to supplement uh, this uh, method here and and get even uh, further uh, improvements. Yes. So, okay. Can you go back one slide, please? Okay, here. So uh, the, the algorithm. Um, I'm not getting like this. Two term, two canceling term thing. Uh, so it's the, the same idea. Uh, yeah, yeah, this is, your, is am, am I getting it right? Yeah, oh. it's the same algorithm. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, I'm just showing how how this algorithm. Works. Okay, <laughs> yeah, sure. basically, initially it's a just gradient sand. We know gradient sand is actually the best, the most efficient way to get to the target. But then at later steps, when the the when we start estimating this density, you see, oh right, I forgot to mention this is the density estimation. These contours here, on the normalizing flow. Okay, so right. the contours are from the normalizing flow in order to estimate V with respect to the, the how the samples have been moving, have moved. Yes. Okay. You see here, we still have the density still broader than the target. Okay. So there's still some, some uh, motion, 
but it's significantly weakened compared to just the gradient descent, right? Okay, okay. And then, uh, then what we do is actually, uh, let's say, let, let's call the first phase burn in. Now we go to this, now we can up sample. Uh, we throw in a lot more samples. And uh, now after really just a few iterations, we get uh, something that is almost perfect in terms of target. Uh, maybe the nosing flow actually, this is one interesting here is that nosing flow doesn't have to be perfect, but particles often are a lot better. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, let me explain now this uh, um, second thing that we do, uh, which is, uh, you know, based on this Metropolis Hastings. Uh, what I said before, Metropolis Hastings does, it, it draws a number around the current position. It's, it's a Markov chain. But you can also draw a, a random uh, a sample from a normalizing flow. And this has nothing to do with the previous position. And so we call this independent Metropolis Hastings, right? Because it has no correlation length. It has, it's not a Markov chain. It has nothing to do with the previous sample. It's a really independent sample. Uh, it's R, acceptance rate is still the same as before. It's literally just um, the target uh, density divided by the normalizing flow density of the new sample relative thing of the old sample. And you just ask, you know, if the ratio of the densities of the target density to, to, the, to, the, to the current density is higher for the new sample than the previous sample, you always accept. And if it's lower, then you accept with some probability. So it's the same idea. Um, but what is nice is that if we have reached the target, um, right? So if Q actually is the true target, this acceptance rate is one. So we have reached in some sense, a perfect uh, acceptance, accept everything, okay? Initially, however, this target density, uh, uh, sorry, the density is much broader than target density. And uh, we accept, uh, this acceptance almost doesn't do anything. It just rejects a few samples, but it's still important because it rejects the samples that are in some sense, the least well-performed. And maybe stragglers that are left behind, uh, or maybe they got stuck in some local minimum or something like that. Those get eliminated by this process. All right, so this is this is not in uh, updates now. For example, uh, you see we have we had three acceptances here out of twenty uh, at the initial stage, um, and you know, they kind of moved closer to the target, right? Maybe not much, but you know they moved closer to the target in 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 some sense. Right? You see here as well. Um, now, at later stages, we accept almost everything. You see, there, there are lots of green lines here. Uh, and that's because the target density uh, and, the, and the current density are almost the same. So acceptance rate is very close to one. Right. For, for, for the new sample at this point? Yes, we have to. And so how do you, do you choose? And no, no, it's one uh, we um, sequentially do, right? Ah, okay, once you do one thing, yeah. and then you do the other thing. Yeah. Yeah. Or in some sequence, like yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's 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 how we do it. Uh, in principle, we could do these metropolis hazings uh, uh, less frequently. It would be just we would also be fine. Yeah, I mean the frequency. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, but so far we have just done it. Uh, yeah. See. He had a question. to see if I got the idea. Is this kind of similar to what uh, the author was presenting last week? So you are trying to- Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. The... It's the same, it's the same idea. Yeah, yeah, right, right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. This is not our new idea, right? This, this was already uh, introduced in Latex QCD and stuff like that. Um, but uh, it comes for free for us because we already have a normal zinc flow for, um, for the, the Trinity Langeron, right? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, and as I said, it doesn't do that much, but it, it does remove some of the stragglers and it, it is helpful. Um, and then there's a third idea, uh, which also is not our original idea. It was introduced by Parner and Marzouk uh, and also Hoffman et al. have done it, um, which is to think of normalizing flows as more powerful preconditioners. Okay, so what is a preconditioner? Preconditioner is something that takes a high condition number problem. Let's say you have a covariance matrix, which is, uh, has, has very large uh, ratio of the largest to the smallest eigenvalue, like something like this. <laughs> Right in in the high condition number problems, gradient descent is very inefficient, right? Because you follow the gradient, you see you don't get very far. You have to do this zigzagging, right? So it's extremely inefficient. Uh, and so what are the solutions? Well, one, momentum that I already talked about, um, but momentum doesn't uh, fully solve this. Uh, on the other hand, if you have second order 
method, like Newton's method, uh, you multiply with the Hessian with the inverse Hessian matrix, and then you know you would get this uh, down down uh, to the bottom with a single step. Okay. Therefore, preconditioning with the Hessian uh, um, is helpful. Uh, one way to think of this is that you have a normalizing flow, which is a Gaussian normalizing flow, and you move to the latent space of this normalizing flow, which now becomes, doesn't, it's not an elongated ellipse anymore, but it's a circle. And then you can sample, um, uh, then you can use gradients and in that latent space, and in that case, you know, gradient will just take you straight to the center. And that's the idea of, of conditioning. Um, and the, the connection to the normalizing flow is that if you think of normalizing flow, very simple normalizing flow, which is a Gaussian solution, then you are doing uh, steps in the latent space of the normal flow. But if your distribution is non-Gaussian, and what stop at the Gaussian uh, description, why not go to something more powerful? Right, and still work in latent space and st still do the sampling in latent space. Um, so that's the idea behind this preconditioner um, uh, norm. So uh, it's uh, some you know, about 10 years ago, uh, some uh, some people, um, uh, and I forget the other name, uh, have introduced um, Riemannian uh, Hamilton Monte Carlo, for example. Uh, that method, uh, the idea of that method was to account for spatially uh, dependent uh, Hessian. Um, that method got nowhere because you have to evaluate the gradient, the determinant, and that's very expensive. Um, with normalizing flows, they're constructed to be simple and they're constructed to actually to get gradients as well. And so this idea is in some sense perhaps uh, an implementation of a spatially varying uh, um, Hessian. All right, so just to give an example of this, um, you know, this is a reasonably ill-conditioned target. And you can see it's gradient steps. These are these blue steps are, you know, really, if you want to get to, to the bottom, right, you will be doing a lot of zigzagging, right? You can see how these steps are kind of orthogonal <laughs> to, the, to, the, to this ellipse, right? But, you know, if you want to get here, from here, you'll be a lot of, zig you'll need a lot of zigzagging, right? This is our normalizing flow fit. You know, it's not perfect, but it kind of gives the orientation along the ellipse target. And in the latent space of our normalizing flow, these gradient updates do this. You see them they're moving much, much closer to the target um, due to this preconditioning, right? So that's the attraction of preconditioning and normalizing flow as preconditioners. All right, uh, let me show you some, examples, uh, some hard examples now. Now we're talking about 100 dimensional, a double Gaussian example. Right, um, and this, uh, this thing to, uh, took, uh, I think we had about 200 particles and it was about 90 iterations. All right, so with 90 steps, we could get a perfect uh, um, sorry, um, multimodal uh, distribution, simple multimodal, but nevertheless, multimodal. Uh, I really want to emphasize um, Hamilton and Monte Carlo, Langevin and Monte Carlo, Metropolitan Hastings, all of them completely fail on multimodal distributions. Uh, because they cannot jump between them. The target, uh, you know, there's a barrier, there's a potential barrier, which is way, way too high. You know, they will never get uh, across that barrier. And so they can sample around one mode, they can sample around the other mode, but they have no way of equilibrating and get the right number of particles um, to describe properly the posterior mass in the two. In order to, to solve this problem, people use annealing, where you start from high temperature and low temperature, tempering, where you, you move, between different temperature levels. So they're much more complicated, those methods. Um, here, the reason why uh, our method works is because we have a normalizing flow, which can describe the, the, two, the two peaks. And it does describe them, and it can describe them properly. And moreover, we have independent metropolis casing step, which then removes some particles from one peak and adds them to the other peak in some sense, uh, if, if there is a mismatch. Okay, here's another hard uh, example. This is 32 dimensional rosin. You know, this is very thin banana. Uh, and again, uh, this, will, this only took 50 iteration steps to get uh, conversion. Um, funnels are notorious uh, for, uh, for, uh, for methods like Hamilton and Monte Carlo. Uh, that's because they really struggle to get into the, this, this neck here. Um, and uh, now if you run 
Nuts is a state-of-the-art Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. Uh, if you run it for long enough, you, you know, it will actually do a good job. Uh, this is a hundred dimensional uh, example. Uh, but again, our methods uh, also does a very good job on this. So uh, and here's another one, another one of those hierarchical Bayesian problems, which are very hard because they have funnels all over and so on. And again, you know, we converge pretty well. Uh, probably the best uh, plot is this one here. Um, defining here the bias. How do you find the bias? Is literally just the, um, think, think of it as an uh, error on the mean square plus the, plus the variance square between the, the true distribution and, and uh, our estimate. And we do this as a function of, well, we're calling it wall time, but really it's just samples because this wall time is in minutes and we, you know, said, okay, each likelihood is one minute. This is basically to, to mimic uh, a lot of our scientific problems where the likelihoods are very expensive, right? For example, in cosmology, often things cost seconds to minutes. Um, all right, so um, NUTS um, has uh, tuning and it takes quite a while to tune in, uh, in these high dimensions. What is it tuning? It's tuning the, the this, this mass matrix, you know, this, this preconditioning, for example. It's only di a diagonal that is tuning, but still takes a, a long time to tune. It's tuning the step size. So it's a lot of tuning. Uh, and you can see that actually, you know, it nuts will take 100,000 100, samples just, just to tune it, tune itself, to, you know, depending on the exam on the problem. Um, our uh, method, uh, and here I'm showing the bias squared, typically, would be that the bias has to be less than 10%. So bias square has to be less than 10 minus two. Uh, but maybe you can get away with 30%, in which case, you know, has to be less than 10 to minus one, right? And so somewhere in between here and here is the target uh, that we uh, require. Um, sequential method, uh, sequential DLMC, uh, in many examples, you see it's an one order of magnitude, maybe even two orders of magnitude faster than a NUTS, which is state-of-the-art um, carbon. But uh, the place where the uh, difference becomes even more dramatic is um, if you can take advantage of parallelization. So typically, Hamilton Carlo is a Markov chain, right? You need to evaluate the previous uh, element to evaluate the next one, right? And you can't really run hundreds of uh, Hamilton Monte Carlo chains. It's not very efficient because of the work and stuff like that. So um, uh, here, instead, our method, you can think of it as an ensemble method because we're evaluating the densities of uh, n particles, where n could be 200, could be 1,000, okay? And all of these particles uh, uh, displacement can be done independently. The likelihood of each particle can be evaluated independently of, of every other. So all of these likelihoods can be uh, evaluated in parallel, right? So if we have 200 or 1,000 particles, we can just, this is embarrassing parallel polarization, right? You just launch, uh, you know, uh, course, 200 cores, collect everything. There's, none, there's no communication needed, blah, blah. You just collect it um, and you're done. And so in this case, uh, these are these orange lines here. You can see, you know, we can be orders of magnitude faster uh, in terms of wall clock time. Okay, so uh, the benefits uh, are, um, well, first of all, you know, this method does take advantage of the gradient um, uh, of the target. So in this sense, uh, it's, it's similar to uh, Langevin and Hamilton and Monte Carlo, but without the stochastic noise, all right? And as a result, it really, you know, and initially it's just a gradient descent, so it really takes advantage of getting to the target as fast as it can. Um, it can use any optimization. It's not a Markov chain, right? And that means it can be paralyzed uh, and that really can, you know, make it faster. Um, it's well suited for and um, it uses normal flow for densification, which means it can of all of these other improvements that people have done, like independent metropolis casings and normalizing flow as a preconditioner. Okay, so um, in the remaining uh, few minutes, uh, I wanna talk about some completely different methods. Um, and we're calling in Michael Canonical Hamilton Monte Carlo. And this is done in collaboration with my, well, the project is led by my student, Jakob Robnik, but it's done in collaboration with Bruno Luke and Stein. And the question here that we're asking is, um, well, can we get a Hamiltonian system to give us an easy Hamiltonian that gives us a target density? All right, this is really the question we are posing here. Uh, we have seen that in the case of Langevin, what we need is to estimate this target density 
you know, via the Fokker-Planck equation. And for that, to achieve that, we need normalizing flows. Normalizing flows are great, but sometimes they do things that we don't really understand. And so there is, of course, a level of concern that, well, maybe there are situations where normalizing flows would, you know, do something completely wrong and will never converge. Right? Um, and so the question is, can we uh, do right on Hamiltonian system without a normalizing flow that is deterministic and that um, gives us the target density? All right, so um, we actually have a lot of freedom how to write down Hamiltonians. I'm, uh, I'm going to present three different types of Hamiltonians. One is the variable mass Hamiltonian. Here, no? it's just uh, it's just a, a momentum pi, and we have a variable. Another one is, for example, relativistic Hamiltonians, uh, where we have the variable speed of light, c of x. Right, the speed of light is changing with position. Uh, and the third one is a standard uh, canonical uh, Hamiltonian. It's also some uh, uh, potential. Okay, so in all three cases, we have, we have M of X, C of X, and V of X. And now let's choose these in order such that the, we get the target density. Uh, we have run some deterministic uh, Hamiltonian uh, dynamics. So the idea is therefore to tune these three things such that the marginal of the microeconomic distribution at a fixed energy. So we have, these are Hamiltonian equations to conserve energy. Uh, and what we want to do is to say, because after we have input out the momentum, right, um, we want to have the distribution to, to follow the target density. So let's say the target density is P of X. After we do this integral over the momentum, uh, this integral is easy to do because uh, it's just um, energy spheres. Um, uh, and we know in E dimensions, right, is it some volume, sorry, no, surface uh, of, of a E dimensional sphere, uh, momentum, D minus one, and divide by the derivative of the Hamiltonian respect to, to the momentum. And of course, this is nothing else, by this is nothing else but uh, V dot, right? The, the, sorry, X dot, the velocity. Okay. so. Uh, what this is saying is um, that um, sorry, one over velocity, I should say. Uh, sorry, no velocity. Yes, um, so that um, with high density, when the velocity is is, is low, and so when velocity is zero, for example, we okay. And this this term here is just simply integrating out the, mo the momentum. All right, so this condition therefore determines that now these three functions. Um, for example, in the case of the mass, this is just e to the minus two L, where now I have described as L, uh, you know, sorry for the change of notation, this is this our U that we had uh, in the previous slide, right? So this is a, a negative log of the target density. All right, in fact, uh, we can, we can uh, do uh, um, a transformation here. Um, and this, this Hamiltonian actually becomes separable. And it's now, it's actually separable in terms of kinetic plus potential, right? So it really is, uh, you know, really, you can think of this as U as potential. Uh, but you see that the kinetic term is actually uh, not a standard uh, canonic, canonical you know, pi square over 2m. Uh, kind of strange form, right? Log. All right, so this is one example. For a relativistic one, we get some other expression for, this, for, the, uh, for the speed of light. And then for the standard kinetic plus potential, you know, we get something like this, right? V minus E is again something that depends on the target. All right, so basically, uh, so you can see now we can, uh, using this thing, we can determine what those mass or speed of light or potential are. And therefore we can write down the, the Hamiltonian equations. Uh, you know, this is basically Hamiltonian equations, they're energy conserving, everything is done at a constant energy. And we have X dot equals pi over M, right? And pi dot equals, this is standard Hamiltonian equations where now, of course, you see now it's it's a derivative of uh, h. For example, in the first case, it was pi squared divided by m of x. Now we have to take the derivative of m of x. Right? This m of x depends on the target. So you see there's a gradient of the target density, uh, gradient of gradient of l uh, in there. Okay, so that's the idea. Um, Going to do here. 
Is it running? I really want to show this movie. Play, where is play? This used to work. Let's see. Loading now. It's doing something completely different on my screen than, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I can, I can, I can stop sharing and share it again. Let's do that. Uh, yeah, let's see. Let's see. Let's do this. Let's try again. Okay, so you see, this is not the magnetic trajectory. This is double, double well, double potential well, so non, non trivial example, uh, only in two dimensions, right? You can see how it's flying around, right? You can see how it's filling up the, the target density. Uh, I don't show the projections, right? But the projections at the end look very good, actually. Um, you can see how it's jumping between at least these two. The, the potential barrier is not too high, so they can jump between these two otherwise. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's completely deterministic. It's kind of turning around as it goes away, right? And uh, blah, 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 right? It's completely deterministic, and yet it gives a target density. So is the point that the like random samples from the target are basically like points on the trajectory at random times? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You just take the samples, uh, not, not samples, the, the time outputs, yes. Sure. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, so, and it, and it doesn't matter. So, there's no burn in. Basically, you start from where. Well, no, no. There is a burn in. Uh, in fact, we started somewhere here. Oh, right. So, th this is a good question. What happens is, um, if you're far from the target, the velocity becomes extremely high. You really, you can see this one here. I, okay, we can, we can, we can run it again. Uh, you see, you see how rapidly it jumped right from here to here. Right. This was extremely large. Uh, step size because the velocity was so high because if you are in the density where density zero velocity becomes infinite really and this is how also it turns around right it really it kind of goes to infinity and back really right in, but because of finite step sizes it doesn't do that right it just it's just you know um yeah it's so fast that it comes back you know <laughs> in a finite amount of time, right? the velocity really are in, in some sense infinite up up here right but they also bounce back right All right, let's go back now to my presentation. Well, yeah, yeah, right. There, there will be some. There will be some integration errors. Sorry. Uh, you mean far from the target? For the burning, yeah, maybe. Yeah, I mean, probably we should throw away a few samples in the beginning, yeah. But it's nothing, nothing like Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, where you have to throw away, you know, you know, hundred thousand samples, right? And, uh, here, here, maybe we need to throw away a few samples um, in the beginning. Uh, let's see, now I need to share first. Okay, um, just a few, yeah. Yeah, then, uh, well, that's, that's actually very interesting. Um, it's amazing how, how good this method is. In fact, uh, 
Eva and, and Luca, uh, sorry, Bruno, um, they wrote a paper first proposing this, uh, this, method, this method, uh, for optimization, right? And that's because it, it is actually exploring, right? And in fact, it's exploring in a, in a way you want. So, uh, which is what I just said, when you have, when your target density is low, you're moving very fast through that, right? And looking for other places, right? Um, and, um, you know, because of what I just said, I said it actually is, goes to infinity and comes back, right? In some sense, right? So it does find these other peaks remarkably well. We have tried this to high dimensions and very large separations. Of course, you have curse of dimensionality, right? The further away they are, you know, the, the more price you pay. But it's really remarkable how, how well it's finding uh, these multimodals. Uh, and in this sense, it's completely different from Hamilton Monte Carlo because we're going to across that that um, um, that potential well. Whereas but here, potential if it's high potential well, great. You just move faster through it, right? Okay, but uh, the thing I didn't understand is that. Uh, if you have these disconnected pieces, uh, just one trajectory is, is also exploring data, or you need to multiple initialization. Yeah, yeah, I mean, this is what I was showing. Right? I mean, this this thing is flying to, as I said, it's flying to infinity and back, right? But it's flying with very large velocities, right? What I've shown you was a very large step size, so you never saw samples okay. very far. But every now and then, it will fly to infinity and we'll find, oh, look, there's something here, right? It will slow down there, right? When it finds the second peak, it will slow down there, and then it will explore that peak. Okay. <laughs> well, there is a curse of the nation, no question about it, right? But still, uh, everything has to be relative here, right? Uh, compared to Hamilton and Monte Carlo, this is infinitely better, right? <laughs> Compare, but look, there, there's this thing that, you know, uh, I'm not sure you guys are aware of it, but global optimization problem is un unsolved. Problem. It will remain unsolved problem. In high dimensions, finding a peak somewhere in the middle of nowhere, which is very narrow, Never, you'll never find it, right? That's the ball. That's that's it, right? So it's an impossible problem to solve, right? So this one it comes closer to solving an, an impossible problem than others. So <laughs> yeah, I wanted to go back to this, uh, like how he interprets, like how he gets samples from this. So, so uh, I guess it's crucial to have a constant step size or something like that, so that you get like no, no, no. Actually, no, it's uh, we are we are using step size. Uh, but uh, but we can correct for it, right? We, but, you know, I mean, you can always kind of skew the distribution by just re kind of re resampling the way the like the trajectory, right? So you you have a trajectory, and then you sample like closer here, and then move further here, and then this kind of screws the yeah. yeah we the have sample to re obviously get. if we use variable step size, we need to weight by better step yeah, size. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, right. Okay. So then the samples are kind of you basically sample time uniformly or whatever, yeah, and then, yeah, okay. Yeah. So does this somehow come out of the mathematics? Which, which one now? I mean, supposedly, okay. So if you if you have your time, whatever, um, and then you do a time transformation, then the constant time step would be slightly different. So supposedly there is somewhere in the, this whole formalism, which kind of would fix for that. If you reparameterize your time variable, then there would be something in the, uh, in this whole formalism, which would kind of correct well, for if, this if as well. If we the time, then we need to move enough. Right? But I, I may, you know, maybe this is a technical detail, right? Uh, let's think of it as, as you know, this thing being uniform in time, this, you know, the step sizes, because that's what this equation is saying. The simplest way to understand this is really in 1D, right? Where this pi to the D minus one is just, you know, one, right? And so this really is just saying the, the target in 1D, what we are saying is that amount of time spent, right? Uh, at a given point is inversely proportional to the density, right? Yeah, so, but, but this is something which you kind of impose, uh, right? So this is like a... Well, this, this equation is starting, imposing it. This yeah. equation is imposing it. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, with, okay. yeah. So this also takes care of this. Uh, I basically get... Okay, I get it. When when you kind of reparameterize the momentum time kind of... Okay, takes yes. that thing. Uh, sorry, this might be a silly question, but uh, in M of X and V of X, this is solving this equation here. You see d, d pi of h, this one is easy, right? So we can actually just go through. Uh, d pi uh, of h, you know, where h is pi square, uh, that's just ah, you know, two okay. h, right? Okay. <laughs> right, so then it becomes a square root of h, which is square root of e, okay. right? So you are, okay. you are finding the p of x according to that. Okay, okay, thank you. No, energy kind of scales out, you know, it turns out this energy doesn't really matter. 
In, well, okay, I should be careful. In in this version, that's true. Uh, there are other versions, like I think, um, I mean, in the original paper by Eva, they, they had some very complicated things where they were doing, they had like a zero energy there and stuff like that. Uh, they had the fitting parameter there. Uh, don't need that. You can see here, right? There's some V minus E here. Here it would matter. For, for this version, it would matter. Okay, so uh, uh, Rosenbrock example uh, in 32 dimensions. Again, this is a similar. The same one as I was talking about earlier. Again, you know, we get perfect result. This is a very hard example, right? It's a very non-Gaussian, 32 dimensions. It's not not real example. Right? Yeah. So uh, all right. So that's it. Um, basically, uh, the message I want to uh, convey here is: uh, stochastic differential equations have dominated the sampling uh, uh, methods uh, for the past whatever 50 years, right? Uh, in some sense, sampling and stochasticity are in, in a lot of people's minds, right? Um, in the sense that uh, people think you need to have, uh, you know, even the expression Monte Carlo, right? And Monte Carlo implies you, you, you know, you're, you're drawing a die uh, right somewhere. Uh, you're, you're drawing a random number generator somewhere, right? But uh, it, they don't, it doesn't have to be uh, the case for sampling methods. Um, the um, two methods uh, that I think are superior precisely because they are deterministic. Uh, the second one, we're still working on it, don't yet know the reach, but it look, it's looking really good, actually, I'd say. Um, and who knows, maybe, maybe we'll take, take off that method. Um, the first one um, is certainly superior to Hamilton Monte Monte Carlo if, um, if you can handle normalizing flow uh, issues. Um, and I think uh, it looks good, but there's always a question, you know, flows of black box that you don't understand and will there be failure modes, right? Uh, and so you need to be tested uh, much longer to see um, what its limitations. So I'll stop here. Okay, so uh, you're surely familiar with uh, variational inference and, you know, with elbow maximization and all of that. So uh, this first example, which you showed the Langvin sampling, the deterministic Langvin, looks very much to me like uh, BI. Like the, the no, it doesn't. Okay, I, 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 yeah. Yeah. Go, go ahead. In the, yeah. Okay, yeah, go in ahead. the following sense uh, to, to me, uh, because there's this, there's a term which kind of pushes you towards high likelihoods and there's a term which kind of pushes you as you also kind of... Uh, showed in one of the plots kind of away from other points right uh, so you kind of you, you make your gradient like this and it kind of pushes you away uh, and then you also actually use a parametric in a way uh, density estimator yeah right. uh, which you could in some universe consider as you know the approximation which you're deriving but then you kind of go away from that to take your points as the actual approximation can you elaborate on on uh, why you would prefer this and and where exactly over over vi you mean yeah over yeah. V, over basically uh, moving the whole flow itself with its neural network parameters yeah 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 to kind so of vi uh, this is this, the, the, you know actually the question i asked uh, piotr last week right as well uh we found that variational inference uh, elbow optimization which is reverse KL divergence um is mode seeking and therefore it zooms in on distributions which are too narrow, right? And we were unable to fix this problem. Uh, we worked, I, mean, I worked on VI for many years uh, and it just doesn't seem uh, easy. Even, even if your distribution function, uh, if, your, um, if your normalizing flows are powerful enough that they cover the truth, they still won't find it, right? They will still go into the, into the wrong corner. So it's really frustrating. Um, and that's why uh, we kind of gave up on the pure variational inference um, for those reasons. We, in the paper, for example, uh, no, we have a different paper, uh, which we're calling POCO MC, I didn't talk about it. Uh, it's, uh, um, it's gradient free, um, and it's not really um, deterministic, it's stochastic. Um, and the, the idea there is you use sequential Monte Carlo 
uh, but in uh, with normal synchro preconditioning. Okay, and on that one, we directly compared uh, to variational methods, and uh, yeah, just leading to the wrong uh, posteriors, right? And so, so that's my concern with variational methods. Um, you know, people are trying uh, to improve them, but that's my concern. Um, but, okay, the other the other comment I have about the variational methods is, I dimensions they are extremely slow. I mean, you know, the training time is forever. I mean, you know, it's like. Why bother, right? When you have Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, really. <laughs> but I guess I mean training a flow in very high dimensions yeah, yeah, yeah. would also be pretty bad, no? For from for us? Yes. Yeah, yeah, but we that's why we use simple flows, right? Which they don't have to be perfect for us. Thanks. Maybe yeah, I can ask you a half philosophical, half pragmatical question. So you alluded to to some sort of like like the flow, you don't understand what it's doing, uh, the black box, the, the usual thing. So specifically, which type of catastrophic failure may occur in, in your method such that makes you concerned? And then the philosophical part is, uh, is this failure more catastrophic than it, it, it is in Markov chain Monte Carlo? Because Markov chain Monte Carlo methods also can fail, as we just said, right? You, you may always never know if not by physics that there is another big uh, variable. Yeah, yeah. So what's the difference? Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't have a simple answer to that question. Uh, this, for example, this is a good example. Um, uh, Rosenbrock, um, some normal flows will just not discover this. Structure. That depends a little bit on the inductive biases of the normalizing flows, uh, things like that. But if you're in very high dimensions and there's a very thin structure, normalizing flow may not uh, be able to identify uh, defining it, right? Uh, that uh, that I have okay. and the stochastic uh, regular method instead is it guaranteed to find that structure? Yeah, the stochastic method will will let's say will take a particle here and will uh, just make local moves, right? And it will slowly slowly propagate uh, along this, right? Um, whereas normalizing flow, if it doesn't see that there's it doesn't learn this structure, then all those gradients will be wrong. Gradient v of v will be wrong, and it will uh, suffer. Um, in terms of conversion properties. Another question, like this. You mentioned many times uh, the source of dimension height, and that is, uh, of course, a known issue. And that's why Antonio Monte Carlo is better than plain uh, uh, MCNC. But how does it scale uh, in terms of time and performance your, uh, your meter with dimension? Uh, which one? The last one? Yeah. Or <laughs> not, not the last one, uh, even the normalizing flow. If I have 1,000 parameters, so. well, normalizing flow is hard to answer this question, right? Because it depends on complexity of normalizing flow, depends on complexity of the target. So it's very difficult to prove any theorems uh, in the case of normalizing flows. Of course, one can do this for Gaussian targets, uh, I guess. And empirically? Huh? And empirically? Sorry? Empirically. Have you tried uh, with a to sample over a distribution of uh, 1,000 dimensions? Sir? Uh, I think we went to 100. Uh, okay. But you know, yeah, for, for for the Tunisian Langevin, we went to 100. For this one, we now have 250 dimensional Gaussian. Um, you know. uh, this one, uh, we are looking at it right now. And you know, I could be wrong, I don't know, but it um, seems to scale a lot better with the machinity than Hamilton Monte Carlo. I mean, okay, I'm sure. it's already much better than, uh, yeah, Hamilton Monte Carlo has this scaling d to the five fourths or something like that, right? And it seems like here we're getting uh, d to the Point six or something like that. So, um, so, but I, I don't know. This is empirical, um, and I don't know. It looks good right now. We'll see. Okay. It's wrong. If yeah. if if that is true, then it's it's a big big deal, right? Yeah. Because we know that in high dimensions only have an if it, moment, if it works, you, often it doesn't work, right? But, I mean, in, in cosmology, for example, we run this Hamilton Monte Carlo, people run this Hamilton Monte Carlo samples on millions of dimensions, right? And they have these correlation lengths, which are in terms of number of likelihood evaluations, like tens of thousands, right? And, you know, for one sample, right? Maybe, maybe sometimes even 100,000, right? And, and this likelihood can, can easily be a full M body simulation, right? Which takes days to, you know, it's like hopeless, right? No, the machine is much better than anything else because uh, the moment that you have a, a very high dimension, you know that you're localizing over a, a, a lower dimensional manifold. And if you try to sample in any other way, you will uh, have a jet ratio that will blow up incredibly. Yeah. 
anyway, so if if we really can improve from 1.2 to 1.6, that would be. Okay, we'll see. Thank you.